Hey guys, welcome to the Zeitgeist Movement Australia podcast. My name is Casey and I'm sitting here with Zach, who is the main host of the Zeitgeist Movement Australia podcast and has been interviewing quite a lot of people over the last couple of months to get this podcast up and running. And so far, he's had the opportunity to interview some really interesting people and answer a lot of really important questions about the Zeitgeist Movement. I'd like to briefly ask you what this podcast is about. Well, this podcast, I interviewed Joe, who's actually a really interesting person. He had a very interesting upbringing in a religious life, raised fundamentalist Christian. And I just want to thank Joe, actually, for being so brave and forthcoming with his story about his life, because it is very confronting for someone to talk about it so candidly. So I am very grateful to Joe, and he offered a lot of insight to me personally, someone who hasn't lived a religious life into how religions work and the thought processes and motives behind them. He was raised fundamentalist Christian and then went through a period of being agnostic and then finally became more atheist. He describes in detail his experience of that and it's really great for the podcast that he came on. So sit back, enjoy the show, it'll be a treat. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about religion and Joe's kind of an expert because he's lived through a religious lifestyle. I uh, hope, yes. But is now not so much religious. What no, can you tell us more, more not so about much. That? Well, I'll start off giving a bit of background about me. I grew up in a very religious family. I grew up as uh, Catholic. We were fairly fundamentalist Catholic, so we kind of had aspects of ritual and fundamentalist beliefs in there mixed together. I mean, it was a pretty stable kind of family environment, but there was also a lot of. Uh, a lot of irrational beliefs that were drilled into me from a very early age. And, you know, I grew up in a community where there were families who were friends with one another who would meet together. So I had this kind of sense of a broader community around me who all believed certain things that were not rationally supported. Um, I think through my adolescent years, what drove me away from it was having difficulty as a result of irrational beliefs, suffering as a result of having false beliefs about cause and effect in my own life. I approach it from a totally different standpoint. My family was not religious whatsoever. Mm. My Both my parents are, well, actually my dad does believe in God, but it's more of a spiritual thing. But my mom and my family at large are not religious at all, certainly not religious, never went to church as a child, despised doing scripture in a public school, so I'd actually stay home that day of the week. Never saw religion as anything more than a social phenomenon to be understood for what it is, which to me is just a remnant of past time when things weren't able to be explained as well and people needed solace, emotional solace and cause and effect solace, needing to understand something and having no answer, so they looked to religion and God. So for me, I never grew up in a religious family, so I'm... As atheist as they come, basically. Like, I'm atheist, as in I don't believe in God, I don't believe in a soul, I don't believe in an afterlife, I don't believe there's any real reason we're here or anything. There's no divine intervention yeah. other than just the universe is the way the universe is. I'm kind of a uh, burgeoning atheist. I'm becoming, I've become atheist more recently. You know, I, I went through this transition of certain belief in um, God and Jesus to doubting belief. That was a long period, a long period of believing, but mm, things aren't quite adding up. Then I went through this other phase of complete reassessment where I'm like, I'm agnostic, undecided. And then I've, I think in the last year, I've really been much more, you know what, I think it makes a lot more sense just to be an atheist. And it's the only rational conclusion I can, can really come to that, re that is consistent with my own experience even. I think it is a very rational conclusion to come to because everyone who's an atheist about all the other gods, just their particular god, they're not an atheist about. And it's just me taking the final step of going, no, I'm an atheist about all the gods. And that was very early on. I never believed in God, to be honest. I never believed in heaven and hell. I never believed that there was divine intervention or miracles or anything like that. So can you kind of describe what you believed and how it kind of evolved? So what was your... When you said you had a certain belief in God, what does that mean? Because I don't even know. It's actually this interesting pattern that tends to come up a lot with people I know who grew up in the same kind of environment. But my pattern was growing up and just 
you go through this kind of childlike period where you just believe what you're told. And then you go through the normal rebellious phase, which every kid goes through, practically every background, which is where you want to distance yourself from your parents, individualise your beliefs. And also just to show socially that you're an independent individual. This usually comes on around puberty or shortly after. That was really what it was like for me. And so I had a period of about three or four years between like 12 and 15 where I was like, yeah, I don't really believe any of this stuff. And that was like worrying my parents. At the time I was 15, they still had a fairly large amount of leverage on me. So what ended up happening was I ended up going on a week-long camp over summer. The whole week was designed to teach people, teach kids in this religious belief and religious practice. It was an interesting combination of having Catholic ritual, but also having having kind of more of the new style, fundamentalist, Protestant, Pentecostal style, kill song music and all that, trying to make it all expressive and cool with the kids. And that was what really got me in, was the expressiveness of it. That was what really hooked me into it all. And I went through this transition of ownership of my faith, where I believed that uh, Jesus was real. Jesus was talking to me. I was hearing voices, and that those voices were telling me truths about the world, about myself, and about other people. And even on that weekend, I went... So you I were went, 15 at this time? Yeah, I was 15. Uh, and even on that weekend, I had I reported these voices saying things to me, and, and I was saying them to other people, and saying them to people who were administrating, and people who were, who were running them. And they were, like, absolutely affirming it, mm. saying, you, you're you going through this amazing transition and you're experiencing Jesus' love and the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is a, this whole weekend was all about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mm. which can tie into what we're talking about later because it, it, yeah. it definitely relates to the subject that we're covering. So basically, it was a social context in which hearing voices is, is acceptable. Thing, is more, more than acceptable, it's a good thing. Yeah. It increases your social standing. Was if I heard voices with my friends and family, they would think I was crazy. Of course, the voices need to be saying the right thing. Basically, that was a big transition. And it's... Have you heard this term, love bombing? I have not. They talk about it a little bit in um, cults. Now, I'm not saying this is a cult, okay? There's, I think there's a... Maybe, maybe this. I don't know. You're saying, but what isn't a cult? When you, when you indoctrinate someone, it helps to just... You just bomb them with love. Like, oh, yeah. Unconditional... Well in quotation marks, unconditional love. Well, it's not really unconditional because you're trying to reward a behaviour. That's yeah, the whole point. I know, but it's supposedly unconditional. Yeah. No, that's when it is very conditional. And so you get inundated with this kind of false affirmation of delusional behaviour. It's kind of... Uh, it's all increased by this kind of love, this intense kind of love, because they're all teenagers as well. Hmm. They're and looking for, like, some sort of place in the world yeah. and to get affirmed and to feel like you actually belong and stuff. Yeah, that's and very pa- powerful to and, a teenager. And their parents aren't there too. And that's all it really takes. You know, somewhere where your parents aren't. So it was all very, looking back, it was all very engineered. The parents weren't there on purpose, but there were people running and facilitating it who knew the parents and were running it all. And so I went through this really big transition where I went, from being a bit doubtful, I've expressed my doubts about religion, to all of a sudden, I've got all the evidence I need, I've had this experience, and I was gung-ho for years. <laughs> what? That's Wait, funny. Wait. That's funny. You, are... <laughs> you just can't imagine me being like that? Well, that as well. Like, I really can't, because I've met you more recently in the last couple of years, and you've been pretty secular from what I can tell. Mm. Because I haven't been. Yeah, because you are. I haven't been in church in like two years, maybe. Yeah. I kind of... Um, I went at Christmas just to be there for my family. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's... But now... But going so back, going, going back, back, how is that? What is... Uh, let, let me elaborate on that, <laughs> shall I? <laughs> yeah. Shall I what, elaborate what gung-ho means? <laughs> I went... I went a little bit off the deep end. I was more gung-ho than most people. Really, like I was, you know how um, becoming in a religious Protestant cir- circles, they they have the um, speaking in tongues and all that. I was really into that and and praying for people and believing that my prayers would have an impact, ma- magical 
magical effects and feeling the need to, what the term they use is evangelize, which is to convert people, basically, and, and seeing that as my mission in life and, and stuff like this. And To be fair, that's how I feel with atheism. <laughs> it's my job to, <laughs> to convert yeah, people. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess when you're really committed to a, to a view, then it's a pretty common thing. But there was... I went through this... After going through this change, all my friends... I started seeing all my friends at school differently. This is a really... One of the most powerful and obvious things that I noticed was I began isolating myself because I didn't feel that I was in my friendship group anymore. So I began isolating myself from people, my friends at school who cared about me. Yeah, it was... I became a lot more anxious. became a much more anxious individual. I... Honestly, I had delusional beliefs about what was happening around me. I believed that there were, like, demons around and the devil was real and there were, like, um, like, this is an extreme case. Not everyone believes this, but I believe that demons were trying to take control over me. Wow. Yeah, it was really intense. I completely dropped out of school because I could not focus on I didn't stuff. know you dropped out I had of school. Intrusive, I had intrusive thoughts going on. It was really destructive. For me, so I had to. I actually didn't finish high school yet because I couldn't handle being in that environment anymore. Wow! Because I felt like I was in danger all the time, so I couldn't focus on schoolwork. There was no point in me being there if I couldn't concentrate. So, mm. yeah. And then after that, I became really isolated. So yeah, I mean, when we were before this podcast, you were mentioning talk, talking about this video, biological underpinnings of religiosity, and I, I noticed a huge amount of parallels. Uh, in uh, my own experience, you know. Hmm. There was this definite isolation that happened because I didn't feel like I was within my own group. Yeah, it, it was it was really difficult. But I eventually got out of this kind of period of isolation. Didn't you go to Brazil as a yeah, missionary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went, I spent, I was, I spent about, a, not that long, it was only about a month there. But I spent a couple of weeks um, in seminary in Sao Paulo as well. Well, just kind of on the edge of Sao Paulo. Even then, I started getting a bit kind of weirded out. No, no, when I weirded out, I became suspicious of the motives of people around me. I sensed that they were really, 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 really wanting me to join and become priest because they knew that if I committed my life, that I would be able to contribute a, quite a sizable amount of money. And there was often hints towards this. Wow. Yeah. That well, obvious. You were how old at this point? About 19. And they were trying to make you into a priest oh. so you can convert, to, so you can um, yeah, and donate doing, money. And they were doing the showering me in love and attention. And I was like, this is... By that, even, by that point, I was like, hang on. Because at this point, I'd been fundamental Christian for quite a few years. And it had been making my life miserable. Like, I was a miserable person. I began to... I'd be, been beginning to doubt a little bit at this point, and it was starting to get more intense through some of these experiences, because I started seeing that a lot of the, these people were so much more devout than people in Australia, and I think a lot of it was to do with the fact that they're just from a poorer background, and by joining the community, by being completely and utterly devout, you, you get, it, it became like a way out of poverty for a lot of people, and these people were just being work, almost worked to death. Sometimes they they did all this work where they ran radio station, TV station, and many of these people would just work so hard that they wouldn't sleep for like three days. So I was just like, and I was living with them, and I was just like, how are these people doing this? And like, there was a real sense that these people were trapped. And I was just like, so I started having some doubts, and just like, is this really what I want to do? Yeah, is this really what I want to be part of? Like, <laughs> there was just a, there was such a greater level of devotion, but mm. not necessarily that didn't correlate with more happiness happiness and fulfillment. It correlated with bad health, just miserable things. Miserable lifestyle. Like, it wasn't balanced. There was no balance. There was no regard for balance in the lifestyle. They almost took pride in getting four hours of sleep a night. Like, what's this thing here? It's a little bit, it's a little bit cultish, like. It is. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I, in my opinion, religions are cults that succeeded in becoming successful and big. Yeah, like I see very little difference between them. But the, the clincher, actually, for me, took a long time. It was health problems. Um, I had, uh, I've still got actually really, really severe migraine. So I've got constant migraine. I'm in constant agony constant nausea. I've had this for six years. In the first few years, I was still a believer. I had countless people 100% believe that I would be healed. 
and pray for me, and nothing happened. I even had one experience at a, at, at a Pentecostal church. I went to my friend's church, and it, this was like a kind of like a little bit like a Hillsong kind of style, but not the same church, but I went to say what church, but I, I visited, and people who just met me for the first time ever, they're like, they, they heard about my problem, they're like, after the service, we're going to pray for you, you're going to be healed, 100% sure, and it's like the Holy Spirit's going to touch you, and, and it's going to be a miracle, and they're very verbose, and I'm at this point, I'm just like, I don't know if God actually wants to heal me. At this point, I believe God still existed, but he just didn't care. Yeah, nothing happened for me. There's this thing that often happens. People who are religious, really, who Pentecost, who've been in Pentecostal churches will be familiar with this. It's called um, resting in the Spirit, where you have this display of God touching you, which involves you falling over, and you sleep. You kind of go into this kind of deep, relaxing meditation. That's how I would explain it. And uh, that happened. So they immediately thought, he's healed. We got it. Okay. So you yep. and, he's, and we converted him. And there was also a, a lot of kind of, yeah, I wasn't fully asleep. But I, I, it's not, it wasn't a real experience. It was just making myself do the sign. And <laughs> it was very relaxing. The human mind is able to will, to, yourself, to, to will yourself to meditate. And that's all it really was. It was just lying back. You know, there was also a lot of, you're going to be healed and you're going to join our church and you're going to turn away from evil Catholicism because there's a lot of Protestant churches who believe Catholicism is evil and they blame a lot of my problems on that. And so there was a lot of conflicting views within Christianity about what the cause of my problem was even. But that's not the story. But yeah, these guys were just so sure that I was healed. And I'm like, afterwards, my pain's still there. hasn't changed. It was relaxing. But I'm, I, I don't feel any better. And the, the, the amazing thing, the reason I'm telling the story was they didn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, wait, 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 wait. No, I'm telling you I'm not. I'm just like, he's healed everyone. They're like, if you... It was almost like I'd enter the twilight zone where these people believe that if they just say it, it becomes real. And I'm like, yes, but I'm not healed. It's just like, no, but you just have to believe it. But I'm, I'm, I'm still in pain. Like, but no. And they say, you are healed. You just have to accept that you are. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not the like, most disconnected I'm, reality I'm, I'm, you can experience? I'm like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why? That was a that was a difficult experience for me, and I like, never went back because I'm just like these people don't actually care about me. Like, they were using my whole. They were using your problem. Yeah, using their religion as a solution to promote their religion. It seems and promote themselves within their own religion. Yeah, because there's a certain amount of. Um, it's almost like you get this kind of divine stamp of approval if you heal someone, or if you take credit for praying over someone and they get healed. Wow, that is messed up. So, I think that actually it takes precedent over that or over anything else. This is particularly common, I think, in this kind of more how would you say fundamentalist, very kind of verbose atmospheres, kind of more outwardly charismatic kind of groups. So, and, and honestly, my transition into religion was very abrupt. It was super abrupt. It happened into religion. Into religion. It was very abrupt, but my transition out was very gradual. Okay. What actually started your transition out? Well, it was, it was a lot of different experiences. Uh, it was realizing that being religious never actually helped me. And I received also a lot of counseling from religious people, some of which was pretty helpful. It wasn't all bad. But ultimately... Counseling can be helpful just to talk about your problems. Mm. I think I honestly think the biggest thing was actually seeing a psychologist who was not at all. It was basically just someone to talk to, who I, who didn't know anyone I knew, <laughs> and I felt completely free to just start telling people, telling someone my experience, and hearing myself speak, and hearing my rationalizations for experiences in my life, hearing me, myself say it, and then go, wait a second. That's crazy talk. That's crazy talk. And I don't, <laughs> I don't need to act anymore. Like, I, cause I don't need to act anymore, you know, and there was a very different feeling I had coming away from a session with him and away from a session with, um, a spiritual guidance counselor, which was that I feel lighter. And the reason was cause I wasn't worrying about what this person's thinking of me all the time. You can just actually be honest. Cause this like... person doesn't know me from a bar or so, doesn't know anyone I know. So there was this kind of weird, uh, Self censorship. Yeah, that was going on a lot. Well, you do that to fit in. Yeah, like yeah. any group you're associated mm. with, if it's one that you can't be completely honest 
in, mm-hmm. then you need to censor yourself a little bit mm-hmm. to fit in. And that's, I think, the problem a lot of people have is they're associated with groups where they really don't totally agree with the ideology or whatever, so they need to to have a consistent view of the world, lie to themselves yeah. about what they're actually feeling and thinking and experiencing. Yeah. And honestly, I think the, the main reason why I moved away was even more kind of... More, more personal than that, which was that all of these religious experiences that I'd had, and I'd had a lot of very intense religious experiences that did nothing but distract me from what was really bothering me. A lot of, because it, because to summarize it, the religious beliefs created a false narrative for me to believe yeah. about my own life, which actually covered up the source of, of, of problems. So there's this two pronged thing. Number one, I have Traumatic experiences, which it, when I was very young, I had some very traumatic experiences. I wasn't able to process that I wasn't able to talk to anyone about. So I had this repressed emotion, right? And when someone enters particularly a very kind of fundamentalist Christian kind of environment, this emotion becomes leveraged against you. This pain and hurt becomes leveraged against you. It's, of, it's often that the people who have the most traumatic past are often the most feel the most emotional reaction to prayer groups, and this becomes an affirming thing. So the source of your pain becomes the source of your strength within the group. Okay. Right? But the problem is you become dependent on that pain to feel that emotion because you think that that emotion is positive. So you definitely start associating a negative thing with a positive outcome, Mm. a negative feeling. Is that what I'm saying making sense? Yeah, it is very much so. You're saying that your cause and effect is screwed up. And you have this weird effect where you start believing that something that's actually causing something bad is in fact causing something good. So you keep doing the thing that is causing something bad because you think it's causing a positive effect. Yeah. But the thing was, um, so I had, I had some trauma when I was younger, right? And this became uh, kind of a source of emotional intensity in, in a lot of the spiritual practice. As I mentioned, I had some traumatic experiences when I was younger. When I started to deal with those experiences outside of religious context, see them for what they were without having to worry about what other people were saying about me or how people might be judging me, I was able to actually deal with that. And it actually put into perspective a lot of the religious experiences that I'd been having later on in life. And it kind of undermined the whole thing because so much of my religious experience was based on misunderstood trauma. Basically, trauma I didn't even know about in my early life. I didn't understand, and that I'd bury, and that became this kind of, uh, almost like a, a, a machine of unresolved pain that just kept the um, religious fervor going for me. When I began to understand that pain, I, the pain wasn't there, and I began to feel more fulfilled simply by just talking to a therapist. That was it. That was... That was really the big transition for me. That was probably the big turning point when I realized that not only that everything that my family and church community had been doing to try and make me better was making me a lot worse because I was being I was being told that I was under attack from the devil and all this stuff when all I was doing was just de- was feeling emotion that was from my past that I didn't understand. So I was experiencing this raw emotion with no context or idea what it was and so they labeled it for me and they labeled it in a way that made me fed into my ego because it made me feel important because well if the devil's attacking you must be important which is really it's really what a lot of people's logic is and um and it became a way of them affirming their own position in the community by being the ones who would in quotation marks fight for me by praying for me and praying the devil out of me because I, I went through some exorcisms as well and they don't get me wrong they're fake but they're intense they're very intense and they're very traumatic wow yeah can you describe because i'm not familiar with um, what an exorcism entails it's like they pray to basically get the demon out of you because you believe it's there you make it real and then you start screaming and you start writhing and you you just fully play the part. You're fully engrossed in, in it. It's, it's humiliating. It's very humiliating. And it becomes almost like further abuse. For me, that's really what it was like. And, wow. and 
But, but the worst part is the people who are praying for you, it affirms their faith and it faith and it affirms their own social standing and it makes them feel it's their benefit and your expense. I was just mentally ill. Simple as that. Because I believed a whole bunch of things that I've been told since I was young. And that became the story. And then the false story made the problem invisible because it gave it a completely different name. And then it made the problem worse and made a new problem on top of that. Mm. But when I actually finally got to the root problem, I realised that none of none of my spiritual trauma, so to speak, none of my intense negative and positive spiritual experiences were coming from anything magical. And I'm like, whoa! And it's, so, it's not something that can just change like that. It's, yeah. actually, it's a huge amount to process. It took a lot. So yeah, that was that was kind of more my experience. Did you want to talk about the video? Yes. Because I like to tie it into some of what I said. <laughs> <laughs> it's base, I'm basically an example from, from this video. Can I bring it up? Yeah. So we both watched a really interesting lecture by Robert Sapolsky, who, for those who don't know, is an awesome uh, neurobiologist. And he did a lecture in the early 90s about the religious underpinnings of religious Biological rituals. Do you want to say what it is? The- the biological underpinnings of religiosity. Yeah. That's what it was. Where he talks about uh, the origin of some of the religious behaviours and rituals, and he goes into some of the mental conditions, diseases, basically, mental diseases, that people have that kind of mask and are even appreciated and accepted in religion. So what did you have to say about that? Well, I mean, there's... I'd recommend everyone to watch it because it's fantastic. There's a lot to say about it. I got like a page of notes. Yeah, I mean, he lays a lot of good groundwork, particularly in the first 15 minutes, which I think is really important to understand. Um, there's no such thing as a bad gene, only a bad gene environment interaction. And which, which we should just stop on that which, point for a little bit because that is really important for people to understand that they use genes as an explanation of something like, oh, I have bad genes, oh, I don't have the genetics for that. Like, I watched a movie recently called Gadiga, where it's like, they yeah. took your blood, and based on your genes, they know, like, what's going to happen to you. And, and I just thought, it's a sci-fi movie, but I still go, oh, it's so inaccurate, why can't they get stuff like this? Because genes have been selected for a very long time, especially in humans, and very little differentiation has been made in the recent years when you could say that we've been going downhill in terms of the strength of the gene pool. But that is not to say that genes are bad. Like, you can have a predisposition for something, but if you don't have the environment that enforces it, then it's not necessarily a problem. Biology does have certain links to religious behavior. And that's that's basically what the video is about. It talks about how there's no advantage to being schizophrenic, for example. You know, no. these people don't usually have children because they're not functional mm. people. But he points out that a milder form of schizophrenia is called schizotypal personality or mm-hmm. schizotypalism, which is the same, comes from the same gene, but it's a milder representation. It's a more recessive thing. And with people with schizotypalism is they have delusional behavior which is associated with schizophrenia, except they can control it and they can choose what context is in which to display it. And it's a little bit more mild, so you can, you know, use it to your benefit rather than it overwhelming you and controlling your life. Yeah, yeah. And um, the interesting thing about the video is he's pointing out how many religious people have schizotypal personality, where it's it's very, one of the core things it's linked to is metamagical thinking, this term that he uses, metamagical thinking, where where the person loses the ability to rationally process reality and instead builds builds irrational narratives like believing that um, if they pray rain will come or mm. something like that. You know? And you know where that comes from? Like that is a behavior that was rewarded because being superstitious is not actually unique to humans. When they did experiments on pigeons and they gave them food at random times, they observed very strange behaviors from the pigeons because neuropathways are made where you look for pattern recognition. Looking for pattern recognition is an advantage. So they might look over the right shoulder and a pellet of food will come out. And in their mind, they make the connection, oh, the pellet of food came out 
because I looked over the, my shoulder. Yeah. And then, quite by accident, they might look over their shoulder again and a piece of food will come out and they'll make the connection, oh, every time I look over my shoulder, I'll get food. So when they did this experiment and they isolated each pigeon and just gave them all random uh, food at random times, they observed all these weird behaviors developing, like lifting your wing or something or looking over your shoulder. Purely because we're superstitious, we are looking for reasons why something is happening. And when humans beca became more agricultural and we relied more on rain and weather, we have no control over the weather. But if you can pray for rain to come and then it comes, that is now rewarding that pattern recognition behavior, yeah. thinking that praying caused the rain to come. And then quite by accident, you need rain, you pray for rain, and you get rain, and you, in your mind, think that pattern is now real. Praying for rain caused the rain to come. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what you're describing is, is basically what he means by metamagical. I think building these systems for understanding the world that can produce false beliefs, mm. because it's not, not scientific. Another thing he said about schizotypal behaviour is they tend to have very fundamentalist interpretations. Of reality, and he's also when he's he's not saying that people who are religious are all mentally ill. And he's not saying that schizotypalism is a mental illness. He's, he he constantly reiterates that it's a spectrum, mm. that it's not um, because there are lots of spectrums in, in boxes, and also that um not everyone in religion is necessarily schizotypal personality. They tend to be more the um, leaders, kind of the priests, the shamans, the people who lead people into a certain experience within a very specific context in a socially acceptable way. He says a really interesting thing is hearing voices at the wrong time is schizophrenic. Hearing voices at the right time is schizotypal. A lot of what I was experiencing when I was converted to Christianity was hearing voices at the right time and being affirmed for that. How my social standing within the group would be bolstered by delusional behaviour, essentially, by being schizotypal. There are a few times where I cross the line from schizotypal to schizophrenic, and it's like, bam, all of a sudden you're out. They don't want to have anything to do with you. They just want to get you away. There's not this universal acceptance of real rationality. It's very... No, very, very site-specific. Site very site-specific, yeah, yeah. And it's very language-specific. Yeah, it's all about... It has to fit within a certain ritual, certain rituals as well. And fit into the narrative they're pushing. Hmm. Yeah. He also touches on the similarity between religious ritual and OCD. You know, and there's this really great quote from Sigmund Freud that he uses that sums it up. OCD is an individual religiosity, and religion is a universal OCD. Where he's basically saying that in some ways, religious ritual... I know a fair bit about religious ritual because I grew up with It's the same every single week. There's this repetition, there's a system. It's all systematized. There's numerology that goes into it as well where they have to follow a certain calendar that they have made specifically up. And no matter what is going on, you have to do things in a certain way. You know? And there's different degrees of strictness in different churches and things like this. But I think pretty much every church has a certain structure. Even the most unstructured churches still have structure. And he's, he's pointing out how these kind of irrational behaviours that communities do are paralleled by people who suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. disorder. There's a certain feeling that it has to be done. Like there's no there's no choice mm. in the matter and it's an activity which doesn't have a benefit but somehow it needs to be done. And it's very disempowering because I remember when I was a kid I didn't understand why you had to go to mass and I was so bored it was always the same. I didn't understand what and it was for, you know. The ritual side never really appealed to me, and it was never what got me into it. Some people, the ritual side is what they love and what they crave. So for some people, they get into it for the kind of more ritual side. He points out that the kind of more orthodox, very religious, very regimented kind of style of religion appeals more to the OCD mm. um, personality. Well, there are... And the fundamentalist Christians, sorry, Pentecostal, Hillsong Church kind of... That's more kind of the fundamentalist, the more schizotypal personality, which I, I've known for a long time. Like, I've noticed this because I've been to lots of different churches. I've, I've always recognised this, how you've got different personality types gravitating towards certain churches. It's really fascinating. And when you have churches in the middle, there's 
always people who are different ends of the spectrum within that church. I find it very interesting, the spectrums of mental disorders, because we call it a disorder like obsessive compulsive disorder or schizotypoidism, but in fact, they can be slightly beneficial in the certain context for even secular people. Like me, I don't have ADD, but I get bored easily. And I open tabs on my computer and will watch something for two minutes and then I'll pause it and do something else. So I have mild cases, and that's what Robert Sapolsky also talks about. Everyone has mild cases of a range of different things. Yeah. But one of the things with OCD is it can actually be beneficial. Yeah. If you use OCD to have a very strict uh, exercise regimen, mm. it can be really... Or a very strict... Uh, study regimen, mm. it can be really helpful. Yeah. And that's something I don't have, yeah. but oh. I wish I did, like have a mild case because, mm. again, they are brought back to brain chemistry. That's what they generally are related to. And another parallel that I found in, in what he was talking about, where he was, he, one of the things he mentioned, uh, which is a common, which is commonly associated with um, schizotypalism, is social withdrawal and detachment. That was something I experienced a lot. The way I'd say is I'm, I wouldn't consider, consider myself schizotypal. I think my personality's changed quite a bit. And I think I was maybe displaying a lot of traits which were pretty schizotypal. I was very withdrawn, very isolated and stuff like that. Yeah, and that came along with the metamagical thinking and the fundamentalist interpretations of reality. I'm a lot happier now. Though. That brings back to the whole reason why we have religion. And in my opinion, this is going to sound fairly venomous, but I really hate religion. And I'm not talking about Christian yet. Christianity or Islam or Judaism. I hate, or even Hinduism or Buddhism. I don't like any religion Anything that is detached from a completely open slate of looking at the facts and looking at the world as it really is, using science and the scientific method to assess problems, anything that is a slight deviation from that is not something I'm interested in and it's something I actually oppose. And to bring back to religion, it tends to reward these generally negative behaviors of believing in religious rituals, using that as a cover to cover an underlying problem, believing superstitious things, believing things that are factually not true because you delude yourself to fit into your community, because humans above a lot of other things crave human interaction and a community. And if you have a community, but you have to present a slightly different version of yourself than what you really are, then you will generally assimilate into that community to get that positive feedback, that social endorsement, I guess? Yeah, yeah. the approval. And, yeah, social approval of fitting of into your society. Whereas if you disagree at the wrong time with the wrong thing in one of these communities like a religion, but it's not, by the way, restricted to religion, then you can be really ostracized. That's something people really aren't willing to do, especially when they rely on this religion. Because religion, to me, in my observation as an outsider, as an atheist for my whole life, I've seen religion as something of a community where everyone kind of looks out for their own. So if you're relying on not only your friends and your family and work connections and things like that, business connections. To lose that community is life-changingly devastating, and people are just not willing to do that. So that's how I see religion, as something of a social need to fit in and emotional solace for pain, generally. I think it comes down to cost and benefit. There are significant costs associated with living away from religion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the community cost, and there's also costs in staying there, which is um, ability to process reality. Also, ability to act totally lovingly. Like, there are certain examples where religious people, while they have this great love and great community sense, it has boundaries. And if you, you step outside that boundary, like maybe in a lot of most churches, if you know, you're homosexual, it's difficult to be fully accepted and fully loved, to feel that way. You know, mm. by your community. And, um, so we love you and accept you unconditionally as long as you're the way we want you to be, which is yeah. straight, monogamous, yeah. have a wife and two kids, mm. have a button-down job and live with a button-down life and go to church every week, yeah. which is something I'm not willing to accept. But, but, I, but there's a lot of religious people who would be saying, look, I love gay people. 
And there's a big spectrum when it comes to topic of homosexuality. There's different levels of acceptance. And but if you like, do take are, the Bible there literally, churches, there are churches which are almost entirely homosexuals, accepting of homosexuals. Um, but if you do take the Bible literally, which is what you were saying earlier, if you are a fundamentalist Christian and you actually read the Bible and think every word of which is true, you are led down this path of irrationality because the Bible is not rational. Yeah. That's the one thing that yeah. really annoys me is it is not updated every year with the newest scientific <laughs> facts. It's these old religious stories of which <laughs> offer very little, if any, relevance to this society. See, I think religion for the most part, has become, especially with our state of technology and knowledge now, irrelevant, no longer necessary for anyone, for anything. Like, I would like to see religion disappear completely and have a completely secular society in the yeah. world, not just Australia. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime. But I think it is an intergenerational thing because as time goes on, cases like yours will become more common where people who were brought up in a religious family, move away and stop being religious because it is the logical conclusion to come to. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of personal experience that went into it as well, not just logic. Definitely the logic supports being convinced. But that's not always what changes people's mind. But what I want to say, just coming back to what I was talking about before, is that having a lack of understanding can cause you to not be able to to love effectively. This is something I, I've kind of discovered more recently, which is that the religious, the structure of religious belief that permeates, that permeates my family made it really difficult for my family to understand my experience and made it impossible for them to love me in the way that they needed to. Didn't matter how much they really, really, really did love me. If, if you don't understand someone, if you don't understand reality, your ability to actually love that person and support that person is greatly diminished. And I kind of fell into a category where their misunderstanding of reality made it impossible for their love to, to reach me. Mm. And that is a terrifying thing. So, and that's one of the reasons why I really dislike religion at, at large, mm -hmm. because their misinterpretation of reality or misunderstanding of reality does cause problems. That's what we have to link this back to, is that living in modern society, understanding modern science, is really important to move human civilization forward. And if you are not living in reality and you still believe, if you have site-specific bias where you are going to believe things and where you're not, mm -hmm. if you say, I believe in science and I agree with the scientific method, but you don't apply it to your own mind and you don't apply it to religion and the logic of religious books, then you're not scientifically minded, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because you can't be biased in what you put under the microscope in terms of criticism. You have to be critical about everything. That's the whole point of science. So in my mind, there are no religious scientists. Yeah. I, I, think, I, I think I'd agree with that statement. There's also something else I wanted to touch on, which was the fact that I really can't reiterate enough just how amazing my family are at, in their intent to love them. Yeah. Like, how... Like, I never saw my parents ever fight in front of me. Never once. They always dealt with their emotions in a mature way with me. Not always. I mean, there were times when I was spanked when I was younger, and I think spanking is actually really bad. Yeah, I think violence against anyone is yeah. really wrong. So Especially they children. They weren't perfect, but compared to most parents, they were amazing. They still are amazing. Yeah. And my family, my, my siblings, we all get along. There's four of us. We get along really well. Mm. Um, I've never really had any big disagreements with any of my siblings ever. Well, you know, I mean, this this kind of still reinforces my point that like just having the intent isn't enough. You actually have to understand as well. Mm. But at the same time, you also if you want, you can understand the people in your life. You can have a scientific view of reality, mm. and if you don't have, but the love is also really important as well. Having a stable family, I think, helped me tremendously yeah. in my emotional development as well. And in some ways, it helped me deal with the challenges that I had have have had in my life a lot better. So it's not all bad. Even Robert Sapolsky mentions this in his talk. Basically, explains how religion ten, tends to have a very low correlation with depression. So absolutely, because you have that community around you. Yeah. And you have something you feel you're living for. Yeah. 
So you have that emotional solace. Mm. Rather than focusing on getting rid of religion, what I prefer to do is just focus on making something better. Yeah. You know, you need to make something for people to go to. I totally respect that view, actually. Because it's not enough to just say, be atheist and just run off, leave your family. And hopefully no, some I don't agree f- with that. And, and hopefully some of your family will come with you. Because many, you've got to understand, many re- people who grew up religious actually have kind of this, more than just the family connection, they have the extended family connection and the community connection and the church connection and stuff. So you're asking to break a lot of social connections as well and not have them have a place to go. Because there's, there's, there's a real advantage in having a social place to go. And I don't believe in solitary religion and I don't, I never believe in solitary religion and I never, so, I, and I don't believe in solitary atheism either. I don't think that we're solitary beings. Well, yeah, I tend to agree with that. Humans are definitely, uh, need community yeah. and need all the things that religion in a way does provide. But I don't think you need religion to provide those things. I agree. That's what I'm saying, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to bring back to my own experience, I've always been atheist. So it's very hard for me to empathize because I have a biased point of view mm. about what it means to break away from your church or religious community because you do tend to lose, as I said before, mm-hmm. if you have your whole family is involved with your religion and your whole circle of friends mm-hmm. and your whole business connections and your wider community is all part of that religious community and you want to step away from the one thing that you have in common with all those people, you lose so much. And what you said earlier about the cost-benefit analysis of that. Some people, I don't think, really genuinely believe in religion, but they stick with it because it's just easier. Yeah. (laughs) And that's kind of sad, though, because I would want people to be able to be honest. I think honesty, especially about this kind of thing, is so important for the species moving forward into a better civilization because we can't be dancing around the fact anymore. We have to really say... What are the problems and how can we solve them? We know now how important having a community is, having people who care about you and you care about them, an emotional exchange and all that stuff. That's all really important and I think that should definitely be part of everyone's life. But those things tend to be associated with religion because obviously there's no churches for atheists. When atheists become a, you know, when a religious person becomes atheist, mm. they just go and do whatever they want to do because there's no community for the non-religious because you don't need to do these rituals and so on again. See, I think atheists are the people who have the courage to say, I don't know, to a large extent. They're like, you know, I can't prove that there is a God. I don't believe in a God. And I'm it's not very saying different. I don't know. I'm saying there is no God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but even then, it's it's more difficult to... You don't have that same... There doesn't seem to be that same kind of sense of having... Of arrogance. Of having... Arro- yeah, arrogance, self-assuredness that is really helpful when it comes to... Religion. Humble. Because you yeah. have to say that there is a God. Galvanising a group of people around a purpose is a lot easier when you have an ideology. Yeah. Because <laughs> That's what I'm getting at. You know, <laughs> because if you have, have a religion... <laughs> And you say, Jesus existed, he did these things, and he did it for you. Yeah. That's a lot more powerful than saying, there was maybe a guy who maybe existed called Jesus, and he maybe did these things. We don't know why he did them, but he maybe did them for you. Yeah. If you introduce all that doubt, all of a sudden your story becomes way less convincing. Yeah. And it's not a very good... It doesn't even, it doesn't even fit on a bumper sticker. <laughs> if it can't fit on a bumper sticker, it's not real. You need a, like a panel on the back of yours. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my thesis in ten font. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, though, reality tends to be a little bit more complicated than what can fit in a bumper sticker or can be memorized in a religious story. So if your reality is a little bit too complicated and you just want to simplify it down, that's what religious stories are. They're the simplified version of this political and social mechanism to get people to do what they want to do. So there's no loose, you know, there's no extra fat in the religious stories, in my opinion, because they were designed, in my opinion, to control society and to be a tool to 
use people as what religion does, which is, you know, takes money from people and also causes them to be obedient, non-questioning, traits that are very useful if you are ruling societies. I think they're often used for that. I don't know if they were designed for it, though. I would there say... There are lots of things that can be used it, for things that they weren't designed for. Yes, I would agree with that. It doesn't really matter what came first. Yeah. It's what the effect is. And the effect of religion, to me, is very clear. As an outsider looking in, religion is just a tool to control people because it causes people to have site-specific, non-scientific thought. You can, can have... you say site-specific? Where they are completely rational and... People who are religious, in my mind, can be very reasonable and rational about every other as- aspect of life, but when it comes to religion, they have a total disconnect to reality, where they can be very scientifically minded yeah. and smart in another area of life that's not related to religion, but as soon as anything to do with religion comes up, they are totally irrational. Yeah. And that's the thing. You have to be scientific and critical on every aspect of life. You can't compartmentalise rationality. Yeah, exactly. And to teach people that it's okay to do that, I think is a really bad thing. Yeah. And it it actually gives birth to all... It it has the potential to give birth to all kinds of other ideologies as well, because people are already used to compartmentalising... compartmentalising their rationality from er, an early age. Kids learn it really young. And that's another thing I wanted to bring up. It would have been very difficult to create religion in the in the magnitude it exists now if it wasn't designed, in my opinion, to... Religion is designed in a way to get into the society as efficiently as possible, and they do that by getting into the minds of children. Mm. If you ever saw a documentary called Jesus Camp... Oh, I've seen it. <laughs> it's about... I've basically fun. been in Jesus Camp, all right? Okay, well, that's very interesting you say that because that is the most effective way to get into a society. It's through the next generation. If you indoctrinate people early, it is far more effective than trying to indoctrinate adults or teenagers because children are very susceptible to having their minds controlled, basically. Yeah, and it's part of of the reason is because they're learning how to process reality. Yeah. Whereas... Adults aren't learning how to process reality. They've already learnt how, like a method. They, and whether that they, method they, is they, right or not. They've developed their, I don't know if this is the right thing, they develop their epistemology, they've, their ability to, how they go about processing. And this is kind of what I'm saying as well. If you can, if you can teach a kid to be religious from a very early age, you can teach them to compartmentalize their, their rationality, which can be applied to all kinds of other beliefs. Mm. And, which can and, be and can, very destructive. And most importantly, they lose track of where they're compartmentalizing their rationality. Mm. So it can be really difficult to actually know, you know, am I actually reasoning rationally from from cause to effect or am I wanting to reach a conclusion and then work backwards, am I backwards rationalizing? Mm. Which is really common. Because often that's what religion is. You have a conclusion set in your mind and you're looking for the evidence to suit your case. Yeah, yeah. Because you're taught the conclusions before you're taught the reasoning. <laughs> Which is a very bad way here to do the, things. Here are the storybooks. <laughs> Jesus healed all these people. It's like, well. And then when the kid gets old enough to learn, to ask questions, you know, how did it work? It's... It might be too late at that point. Yeah. I'm glad you got out. I'm glad you got unplugged. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. That's good. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to touch on about atheism is subconscious connection people have with religion and being a moral person Mm. is something I find really disgusting because in my Mm. mind, being religious is the opposite of being a moral person because it does not promote values that are moral, in my opinion. Being an atheist and doing away with all religion actually does. And that is not to say that Moral people are all atheists and all religious people are unmoral. Yeah, I don't know, it's complicated. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts in the question like this. Yeah. Because yeah. um, there's a lot of religious people who've done amazing things. Absolutely. And That's exactly what I said. And there's, there's, there's a lot of religious people who've done horrible things. And there's a lot of atheists that go, oh, there's no God, I can do whatever I want, I'll just go murder a bunch of people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, actually, 
as atheists as we have any atheists. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The facts don't matter. Only my conclusion matters. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I can recall a specific case. An atheist could clearly go and do something bad. Just like someone They probably have. I don't know. I don't know the religious backgrounds of all the mass murderers. Yeah, but does that really matter? Like, no. there are clearly some in both camps, but are people who are atheists generally of a higher standing? I would say yes, because they have now worked out that you don't be site specific with your scientific rationality. Mm. And to believe in God, to me, is very rational. Um, as long as you have a sense of ethics, which you apply to everyone. And I certainly have a sense of ethics, and I'm not religious. My ethics are nothing to do with anything other than being a nice person, being nice to other people, treating myself and others with respect, and trying to do the best for future generations in terms of preserving this planet and doing the least environmental damage and hopefully... Healing the planet in some way. It's good. It's good because I, moving into atheism, I don't want to lose all of my moorings, so to speak. Mm. I'm going through a process of really um, trying to. I'm not totally there yet, but I'm going through a process of really trying to define what my ethics are, you know, and what what drives me as well. Your I don't, ethics. I don't can... want to become these kind of. I don't want to be a relativist. What do you just explain for people? What well, is a relativist? <laughs> Relative. Well, it's relative. So, um, <laughs> I don't want to be one of those people. One of those pe- I want to believe in an objective reality, objective truth, and not say that you have your truth and I have my truth. Because there is a that, truth. Yeah, that was something that annoyed me even when I was a theist. That used to piss me off so much. Because, but I'm mean, of course back then I was like, well, the only truth is my truth. So. And fuck everyone. Else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. I guess we're getting into a bit more philosophical territory now. Oh, is that not allowed? No, it's okay. <laughs> it's just more difficult, that's all. Philosophy's hard. I... <laughs> it's really hard. Um... Let me say my views. Okay. Yeah. So, I think there is no correlation or overlap necessarily with being an atheist, that is, not believing in God and having a moral compass. I think you can clearly have... Oh, yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But yeah. some people just seem to not mm. really have... Your moral compass comes from your own beliefs about the world. So your own beliefs about the world, if guided by religion, can be a certain set of things, and some of those morals can be good. Yeah. But if you are an atheist who also thinks about philosophy and what are we here for, what are we doing, why, what is the purpose of my life? Am I just here to serve and have the best time for me, or am I trying to help other people as well? Mm. You kind of reach a set of morals, in my experience, that are more detailed and better at explaining the world because you can revise them and update them and add to them than a religious set of morals could ever achieve. I think religion has a problem with applying ethics. Applying, yeah, applying ethics universally. Mm. I think there's, well, there's, because there's, a I lot think of, there's a lot of double standards which go on. And that's and one thing that... Double standards are actually more complicated than universal principles. You know, universal principles are simple. You apply them to everyone. You know, whereas... They're easy like, to remember. Then it's like, well, it's like, read, like, the Old Testament, you know, the such and such a people went and slaughtered 10,000 of such and such a people. Oh, God, but they weren't part of our religion, God, so they don't count. God was pleased. Yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of that. Um, and there's also, um, if somebody, um, if somebody doesn't... Fulf- fulfill this certain law, then they'll burn in hell for eternity or, mm. or whatever. Um, well, another problem I have with like religion... Th- there's, there's, there's more and more clauses to it, and, and I think there's the, the more universal ethics can actually be simpler. Yeah. Another problem I have with religion is that it does promote child abuse. Because I think indoctrinating children is child abuse. If you are spreading lies about reality... <laughs> <laughs> to children, that is child abuse to me, and that's exactly what religion is, because religion cannot and will not survive if it doesn't indoctrinate the next generation. That's the only way it can. As we said before, adults are not susceptible to this kind of indoctrination. Their worldview has already formed. So if they took an ethical approach 
to their religion, let's say they thought they had the truth or something that would help society, they would go, fine, but we're not going to actually force people, I shouldn't say the word force, but indoctrinate people into this way of thinking until they are, say, 18. And then they can make up their own mind whether this is beneficial to their life or not. And for the most part, if you have someone who's an atheist up until they're 18, like I was, Mm. it is unthinkable that you would ever become a Christian at that point. Mm. Or it was, at least, for me. Yeah, I mean, you would be. Because I only ever saw religion as a social phenomenon to be observed. Nothing that I would ever participate in. Other than, like, the interesting... Curiosity? Yeah, curiosity of, I wonder how other people think. This is a very interesting scientific study to conduct. Mm. What are the thought processes of religious people compared to my own? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to go to a church one day, actually, just to see what it's like. Mm. It would be an interesting experience, because I've never actually been to a church Mm. mass service. Yeah, there's lots of different types. I, I would just go hardcore. (laughs) <laughs> would, you, would you try to blend in as much as possible? I would, yeah. And just see how people treat you? But I, I would, would you go full undercover and forget your own name? I would use a <laughs> different name. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you said this, because uh, I've actually already done that. Oh, really? When? You never told me this. <laughs> uh, not in Brisbane. This is actually years and years ago in high school. Yeah. Because I was, again, totally non-religious. Yeah. But I was always fascinated by the idea of religion. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, at school assembly once, there was an announcement. And they're like, by the way, the Christian group is on this lunchtime at blah, blah, blah time. Anyone is welcome to come. Doesn't matter who you are. Just come along and Mm -hmm. it'll be fun. And the two, like, people were giving an announcement. Like, yeah, it's free. It's just come along. And I thought, yeah, that'll be interesting to just see what, like, They have to say, because I am actually fascinated Mm. by religion, but not in the way that I get involved. Mm. It's the way that I look at it as something else. So I've been fascinated with... okay, I'm not going to judge you for going... (laughs) As if I'm going to be like, oh, what an idiot. (laughs) No, no, I'm not that. You can't believe believe that shit for like two days. (laughs) (laughs) never did. (laughs) But it's funny because I've I've done this with other religions too. Like, that's the whole point. It is in my mind, a subtle scientific experiment for myself to compare how does my atheist thought process compare to religious thought processes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, I went, and of course, if you go to a Christian group, they just assume you're Christian. Yeah. And I never said I was or I wasn't, but they just assumed I was. And Did I they just... ask you to speak at any point? No, no. Oh, well, yeah. Like, just, oh, how are you? What's your name? You know, that kind of stuff. Like, the normal... So they, so they didn't ask you how you found Jesus or anything? No. no. Did they ask to pray, of, pray for you? I didn't get that involved. Okay, like, right. I don't know. I went and it was... Actually, it came, the first time I went, it was because they were showing The Da Vinci Code, the movie. And they were... Why? Because they were saying, you know, this is like this evil thing that's lying about religion and stuff. And I'm like, Anyway. That's an interesting place to start. Okay. <laughs> but I was, but I love yeah, just, like, like Tom Hanks. <laughs> anyway, I love just getting involved and blending in with a group that I completely disagree with, especially something like religion. Because that's always a fascinating ex- yeah, experience I know, I know, for me. I know what you mean, yeah. So, but I went back because I actually had fun. Yeah. Because the nice starts. people. The it's nice just, people. <laughs> just one bump, it's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> this keeps me level. <laughs> anyway, so I went back and I went back a few times and then I was really fascinated and also disconcerted by the conversations that were taking place. Yeah, yeah. Where they were talking about why and how evolution is not true and that they never found dinosaur bones and it's all oh, just really? gods. Oh, I was never even that. like. And it's all gods test. That, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Wow, because as I kind of sent to test us, that's a great one. As I had actually that. infiltrated the group, I was able, as not without being ostracized, to say like, "Oh, so why do you think that?" Mm. And it was very interesting the thought process um, that they have about their complete irrationality. That's what you got to do. You just get them to talk. Just keep asking questions. I know, yeah. and <laughs> it reveals their irrationality. And that's what you were saying earlier about the compartmentalizing your rationality because you start then, br- you start bringing rationality where it doesn't belong. 
<laughs> or your nationality like, oh. where it doesn't belong. Because then... In, in, in their view, it doesn't belong, sorry. Yes, because after lunch, when you've had this meeting, you have to go back to maths class and be very rational and logical about how you solve a problem. It's a double wife. <laughs> It's like having a second family. <laughs> so you have to forget who you are. Yeah. And it's yeah. weird, isn't yeah, it? Because it is it's it's a lot of work. It's not, like, it's not as much work as having two families, but it's a lot of work. But that's yeah. what I would think. You do have to kind of have your religious mindset and your normal rational mindset and be able to change yeah. from one to the other. See, that would be very taxing for it's, me. That would be a lot of work. It's taxing for everybody. But why do you do it? <laughs> I don't know. Why do you get... Because you feel so socially accepted. Mm. So, is that the answer to kind of undermining the need for religion, causing uh, to cause religion to crumble? You kind of need to have a sanctuary where people can feel like yeah. they're in a community. That's what I was getting. Yeah. yeah. You got to provide the same emotional and social need, the social sense of security, interaction, except. Being accepted for who love, you are, for who you are, and love for a lower intellectual price. Yeah, you know, because you are paying a huge price. Yeah, you're paying, paying like you're compromising your, yourself, your, your mind. Yeah, your so, way of thinking, exactly. the level of rationality that you go through the world with, so and all, that's a very <clears throat> valuable thing to have. So, all you got to do is just provide the same positives for less cost. That's that's all you've got to do. But I think humans... And I don't think there's any other way it will ever happen. I think that'll happen naturally. It might, because it might end up being that being a theist just costs that much more. But I think people can well, have a better deal than just becoming... Just leaving all uh, church, all, all groups, all community groups, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I'm involved with... You can be involved with lots and lots of different groups that are not religious. Like, yeah. for instance, I have... I do jiu-jitsu and martial arts... And I have tons and tons of friends in that community, mm. and we socialize outside of the context of jiu-jitsu. We, mm. you know... Yeah, that's good. So there's, it's like a religion, except instead of going to church together and believing in God, we do jiu-jitsu together. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think there will be a point where it actually becomes too expensive to be part of a church because that will be actually shunned by the rest of society yeah. as being kind of irrational and stupid. The less people do it, the more the intellectual cost is magnified. Because, yeah. Because, and, the, and also just the way that science is becoming kind of... Mainstream and acceptable. Yeah, at least. And I think people are becoming much more cynical about religion as well. Well... I think the internet has a lot to do with that because people talking about religion and exposing its irrationality and inconsistencies causes people to question their beliefs. Mm. And obviously this is not something I experienced, but I would imagine it would be difficult for someone who is religious to navigate the internet without coming across things that rail on religion. Yeah, the problem is when things rail on religion and very often they're not done well. They're done in an insult way, not as a asking questions way. Because oh, asking questions is the most effective way of derailing religion. Yeah, and also just because something's against religion doesn't necessarily mean that it's well researched and accurate. Oh god, no. Because like I've come across. Um, oh god, no. I've come across <laughs> when I was religious. Like, I came across a lot of videos that I was just like, "Are you serious? They haven't even done like this is just not true. At least it's not what I was taught about religion. Maybe they're getting something from somewhere else." Um. But for the most part, I think probably the worst offenders were like the kind of Protestant and Baptist videos about Catholics. That they were the worst. <laughs> Some of the stuff they would come up with. Well, I really like, can't speak on behalf I was just of. Like, Are you serious? Christian kinds of flavor A fighting with Christian flavor B because oh, that's not crazy. something I'm interested in. Yeah. But it's, I'm it's I'm thing. interested in atheists against. Religions, yeah, yeah. as in a collective of all religions, not just all the, the Christians. Point, the point I'm trying to make, generally speaking, is that uh, not all anti-religious videos are necessarily that well researched, and they're clearly not 
done from a perspective of people who have actually been in religion. But the good ones kind of float to the top, like yeah. the, the God delusion yeah. and so on. The worst, the worst ones are... The, the, even the bad ones are often better researched than the, reli- dumb, the ones done by religious people against other religions. They're usually the most biased. They I would like, imagine they are. Because it's like they get... It's like they get stories that are just made up. Like, they must be from The Onion or something. Like, just... <laughs> <laughs> like, like all kinds of like I don't know I can't remember any of them off the top of my head it's been a long time since I've read anything of that so. Yeah. so where do you see yourself now as a person who is kind of atheist but looking for bearings in terms of morals where what are you seeking in terms of spirituality if I don't want to use that word because that implies you believe in spirits but that kind of stuff I don't know if it implies that um I'll use spirituality then. I don't know what. It, I don't know. It's it's a tr- it's a tricky word. I mean, no, no. But answer the question. Answer. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> um. I see myself as. Uh, it's a it's a difficult transition. Um, I see myself as an atheist. I do. Um, so you're not even who, open to the idea who, of God existing who now. Who is who is still no? I don't. I don't. I'm not open to the question. I feel like the question of God existing is a bit weird because okay. it's like it's you, you particularly the, um, the Christian God who's outside of the universe. Like I don't know how you can comprehend something outside the universe or how it can even be relevant to us. Um, and I'm just, it's kind of, I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in questions of God because I don't find them useful morally or physically. Um, but, um, the human mind is a deep thing, you know, and relationships are really important, you know, uh, love is really important, community is really important, and, I think um, the truth is important, even when it comes at a high cost, you know. Um, and I think that's definitely something I believe in. Um, and I believe in finding a way to um, follow a sense of universal ethics mm. that apply to everyone equally. And well, have you heard of Sam Harris? Well, yes, I have. <laughs> because he his, wrote a his, book. His recent book, Waking Up. Okay, but he um, also wrote a book called The Moral Landscape. Yeah, I haven't read that one. Okay, that's a good book about the uh, atheist morals, I guess, where you don't really need religion. Yeah, I've been exploring... Um, um, I've been exploring um, kind of atheist morals, secular morals, and stuff like that. Um, but it can be the same as what you had before. And There's no difference. Yeah, All well, that's missing... Is, I'm, not finding, I'm not finding too much conflict, to be honest. Yeah. All you're um, missing is the crazy stories and the crazy irrationalities, which are all fat that can be trimmed away, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, there's a, one book that I, I found really interesting recently was Sam Harris's book, Waking Up, this recent one, where he's talking, he's talking about um, spirituality from... In a, from an atheist perspective, and um, understanding your own mind, and uh, understanding the power of meditation, and the power to, to focus and understand the deep parts of your own mind, and I think there's a lot of value to that. Like if you call that spirituality, then yes, I was, I'm interested in spirituality. Oh yeah. Um, if you use that definition, then I because he too. he takes a very scientific approach to spirituality and. Because he's, he's this guy who's, who's, um, he's a neuroscientist, and he's also spent many, many years, um, um, studying various, various forms of strenuous meditation mm. and stuff. So, and yeah, he's, well, he's you had can't, a wide range of experiences. You can't look at spirituality outside the context of many things, including, but not limited to, brain chemistry. 
that's very relevant to mm. spirituality, and that's not something that's ever talked about in religion. Yeah, when it when it when it comes to when it comes to exploring one's own mind, you can't just leave science at the door. You need to bring it with you. you to, I think that's you the main to tool that you use, use. Yeah. or you know. Yeah, and I think there's and and um, people have this tendency to just kind of be content with just irrationality when it comes to spirituality, and I don't, I don't, I don't like that at all. So, in terms of the things that are a bit more fringe. Uh, like overlap, you might say, between believing in God and being an atheist, like afterlife and soul and, you know, meaning to the universe. Where do you stand on that? Well, we have no evidence of afterlife. We have no evidence of soul. If it turns out that I die and there's something after it, well, I'll deal with it then. But I'm not going to deal with something that I don't have evidence about. That's a pretty good answer. So I can accept that. Um... <laughs> This that would be my response as well. I don't, I don't like questions about things to which we have no data, we have no information. You know, um, so yeah, that's, that's all we really have to say about that. I mean, there's, there's nothing else to say because there's nothing else to know. But then, by that logic, but I know, there's nothing else I know unless there's some kind of other evidence I don't know about. Okay, that's a pretty good response. Thank you. <laughs> One other thing that I find very interesting is that it's politically correct in the running of politicians for office to market yourself as a religious person, and I wonder why that is. Is that only because the majority of society is religious, so it is socially acceptable to just fit in, or is there a deeper meaning to that? No, I think there's truth to what you're saying. I remember I saw uh, the documentary Richard Dawkins and uh, Lawrence Krauss. The unbelievers. I haven't seen it, so you'd have to describe um, so it. So they're basically it's it's a kind of a short kind of documentary following um, kind of different them appearing on media, mostly in Australia for some reason. They went a trip around Australia doing all kinds of media interviews and, and talking about atheism and talking about hang on, why are we why are we um, so religious? And they mention that in the United States there's like one openly atheist. It's like being gay. In the federal, it's yeah. like openly openly no, atheist. Actually, I think there's more openly gay people. In it's politics. weird though. It's actually yeah. It's worse um, because to then, not believe in God is actually to contradict like their constitution and their money in a way because they have God and their constitution written into the exactly. They have God written into their money and their constitution. Yeah. The um, and what they were saying, uh, I can't remember which one of them was saying this, but one of them was saying that there's no way that there's so few atheists. They're, they're like, there's got to be some, a lot of closet atheists. In. Well, that's what we were alluding to earlier with the people who don't really believe in God and don't really go along with all these ideas. But they go to church and they fit in with that community because that's the community that they know and the community they have. And it's actually beneficial in their cost benefit analysis to stay with that community rather than sever the tie and yeah. lose their family, their friends, and their business connections and so on through that religious community, which kind of is their whole friends, their whole life, basically. So to lose that is to devastate their life. So they're an atheist, yes, but they go along with the religion because it's socially acceptable and because it's beneficial. Mm. This is the reason why you need to give people a sanctuary a, a sanctuary where they can still get those things, isn't it? Because these are all important things. Religion does a lot of important things for people in their personal I think I know where that sanctuary is. The zeitgeist movie. (laughs) Oh, yeah! (laughs) Thanks, everyone, for listening to the podcast. We'll wrap it up there. Yeah, thanks for listening, everybody, especially other Zeitgeist Movement supporters, both nationally and globally, especially to those people who are in our area, which is the Brisbane region in Queensland, Australia. We have an event on the second Saturday of every month, which is open to the public at the Brisbane Square Library. And you're more than welcome to attend. We'd love to see you there. The event is run by Casey, and we use a minimum opposition vote to determine what the next monthly movie is going to be. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun. We also finish up with a social night afterwards, so I'm sure you'd enjoy it if you come along. 
If you want to find out more about Zeitgeist Australia in general, check out our website www.zeitgeistaustralia.org and if you want to find out more about what's happening globally in the Zeitgeist Movement, check out thezeitgeistmovement.com. Thanks for listening everyone.